Hey, all you nerdsers and nerdserettes, it's your buddy Matthew Clixton here again with Nerds, the podcast about nerd and geek culture. Today we have someone really special, one of my good buddies, Alex Winter. You know him as Bill from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure or some of his other films such as Lost Boys, but oh my goodness, he's so much more than that. He is a writer-director of various features like Freak. He's worked on a few uh, television shows like Betas that was on Amazon for a little while. And uh, he's even done a few really amazing documentaries about tech. He did the Napster documentary, Downloaded, and the more recent documentary about Silk Road, Deep Web. Uh, While we were finishing this episode of this particular podcast, we uh, came to find, too, that Alex is now, as of last week, the most successful Kickstarter funder of all time for his documentary about Frank Zappa. It also led to some great press for Alex. He talked with Forbes about the 25th anniversary of Bill and Ted's coming up here. And what sounds like, you guessed it, Bill and Ted's 3 is probably finally going to actually happen. Now, it might seem a little bit strange that Bill from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure would do documentaries about tech and also Frank Zappa, but there is a theme here. There is a method to this man's madness, and it is misfits, outsiders, weirdos, people a little bit off kilter, the outliers, if you will, nerds and geeks of today. So let's listen in now to this interview that I did with Alex Winter a little while ago and uh, how this all comes together in a world of tech, outsiders, nerds and geeks, and what it means to be a weirdo today. And I, I, you know, I think that, that, you know, the types of stories that have always interested me have always been about, you know, the most dramatic way into exploring you know, what it means to be human, um, you know, for me, tends to be about exploring uh, the outsider. Alex started to talk about how he was inspired by various outsiders when he was younger, uh, be they Buster Keaton, who was more existential, Chaplin, who was more endearing and lovable and playful. This led him into his teens, getting really into the German New Wave filmmakers of the 70s, like Fassbinder and Werner Herzog and Schlundorf. And of course, you know, Dostoevsky, the ultimate of the outsiders with books like Notes from the Underground. Uh, this later connected for him in his interest in uh, contemporary outliers, people who would grow up to forever change the world of technology, like Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook, and certainly Sean Parker and Sean Fanning of Napster. And that's definitely what I what made me gravitate towards, you know, Sean Fanning's story and what I found compelling about about the Napster story. Alex and I began talking about the way that the outsider might walk the line between hero and antihero in literature and film, and certainly in the real world. Take Sean Parker, Sean Fanning's co-founder of Napster, the way that he's portrayed in David Fincher's Academy Award winning The Social Network. This is something that Alex and I would talk about a little bit more later down the road in the interview. But the fascinating thing here is that uh, let's take the guy who played Riker from Star Trek in the documentary Trekkies. Uh, One of the things that he says in that film that's really interesting is that so many people in the Star Trek fandom world, they love the Klingons. They love villains. It's the same way that people in the Star Wars fandom world love Darth Vader. And Alex and I were trying to figure out what's the value here of that sort of outsider, of that sort of Byronic bad guy. People like Dostoevsky and even some of the filmmakers of German New Wave. I mean, as much of a genius as Fassbinder was, he wasn't exactly the nicest guy in the world. So why is it that people like Alex and I, maybe with more of an artistic temperament, could go so far as to admire people who are not just outsiders, but even kind of villainous? I think for me, um, and it's true, the only two acting jobs I've taken since I quit acting in 94 have both been playing bad guys who kill people and get killed. You know, I think for me, it's, it's you know, the human condition, uh, you know, whether you look at it spiritually or, you know, or from a secular standpoint, is, is mysterious, right? Nobody, you know, we all learn... You know, at some point in our childhood, it's really that loss of innocence. We all learn that nobody has the answer. There isn't anybody alive who knows for sure what's up. And so the human condition remains a mystery. So for me, I've always been drawn to the outsiders because they have the courage and the honesty to say, okay, I don't know why the hell we're here 
or, you know, the answers to my own kind of either existential dilemmas, social dilemmas, spiritual dilemmas, you know, socio-political dilemmas, it's all up for grabs. No one's got the, a hard and fast answer. So, you know, as an outsider, I have the courage and the wherewithal and the interest to turn inward and really plumb the depths of those questions. And so I find that the outsiders, whether they know it or not, um, and oftentimes they do, are really um, taking very risky, um, uh, taking a very risky sort of societal and human position and plumbing those depths. Fassbender, you know, whether you like him or not as a person or the way he treated people, had an enormous amount of courage. I mean, he was examining sort of, you know, human uh, and moral questions that, that when I was in my teens, I just didn't see anybody addressing anywhere. I mean, I was just continually blown away by the boldness and the, you know, the the depth to which he was willing to go. Of course, it's kind of funny that there is this connection between people who are brave enough to be individuals and themselves and their artistic expression and shall we say, personalities that leave a bit wanting. Folks like cartoonist Robert Crumb, Charles Bukowski, Joan Rivers, Dorothy Parker, the list goes on. So I asked Alex, what does he think about this complexity of outsiders? Outsiders don't tend to be people who go, I have the answer and it's this. You know, they tend to be people who go, I don't have the answer, but I'm going to explore the mystery. And that puts you outside the law. I mean, it's that great Bob Dylan quote who's, I'd say, you know, one of my greatest influences um, because he's always been an outsider. You know, Bob Dylan has lasted because he never he never attached himself to any of the movements that were going on during, you know, the times that he's been active. He was not part of the rest of the folk movement. He didn't really attach himself to the rock rebel movement. Um, and you know, his whole perspective was always that, you know, he who lives outside the law has to be honest. And I really have always related to that quote as being very, very descriptive of the outsider perspective is they're often outlaws, but they tend to be more honest than those who are ascribing by the, by the law or the rules. Aha. But what exactly does Alex mean when he used the word honesty in reference to Bob Dylan here? I would use Sean Fanning as an, as a concrete example. Um, I would say that Sean, um, you know, came from a dirt poor background, Um, he didn't understand money or sort of popular, he didn't understand the laws and the rules of the road. You know, this guy was like raised in motel rooms. He had, he had a very sort of Dickensian background. Um, you know, no one in his family had ever gone to college. You know, he taught himself, he was very brilliant, taught himself everything. So he came at things from a very pure perspective and he, he built Napster because he really believed that the world needed a global community, that it would help spiritually um, to bring everyone together and that the Internet wasn't being used to its full capacity to actually uh, be a kind of democratization of culture and of society. And that was his motivation. He used music because music spoke to him because it gave him an emotional uh, sort of connection and he knew that people connected through music. But his end game wasn't file sharing. It wasn't sort of like, you know, downloading tracks for free. It was using music as a way to connect people together. And then once they were connected, they would stay connected. So to him, the law, the idea of the copyright law and and the rules and how are they were supposed to work, he, it wasn't like he set out to buck those. It just wasn't even on his radar. So that's that's that duality of the honesty of that. He honestly wanted to create this thing. He honestly did not want to destroy the record industry of fuck artists over, but he lived outside the law in order to create that vision. And I think that's still something that people don't get about Napster because people don't tend to think that way. They tend to think in very black and white terms and you're either a bad guy or a good guy. Now, wait a second. Even in winter's fairly even-handed documentary about Napster downloaded, there's some clear examples of both Parker and Fanning being rather contrarian, perhaps even a little boastful. We all remember the VMAs when Sean Fanning showed up wearing the Metallica t-shirt. So isn't there a little bit of a villain in them and a little glee in their having had some small part in the crumbling of the record industry? That's duality. That's the duality of the outsider. I think that that to me is exactly why it's interesting. My whole point is it's not about condoning it or not condoning it. 
It's not about saying that I think this is okay because his his motives were pure. It's be it's beyond the law. It, it is not. That's what I was saying about the polarizing nature of the reviews. Is nobody's looking past the law. Mm. It's like. Of course it was piracy. Of course it was breaking the law. I mean, that's why I included those quotes in the movie. I purposely didn't try to push Sean to, to, to try to exactly what you said about Scorsese, which I think people really wanted in Napster, and I just refused to do it because I knew that it would be bullshit. I refused to push Sean to say, come on, man, you knew this was stealing. Instead, I actually allowed these very kind of self-serving quotes yeah. where he basically is kind of smirking, yeah. and he's basically kind of saying that, you know, we knew Metallica would be pissed. It's like, that's what that's the swagger of Bob Dylan. That's yeah. the swagger of Travis Bickle. That's the swagger of any of these outsiders. Of course, Sean Fanning was slightly anarchistic and was like, you know what? The world would be better the way I see it than the way it is. Mm. Kind of fuck everybody and their law. <laughs> we talked about the unfortunate reality of what happens when a supposedly pure outsider like Fanning creates something intending to be pure, how easily that can be taken from him and turned into something else. And I remember when I met Fanning in 2000, I was like, what's... It was, a, it was hell for him by then. Everything was, had been falling apart. It was like a horrible death. And I was like, when was, what was the highlight of this whole experience for you? And he goes, basically coding this thing and uploading it. And he goes, from the minute I uploaded it, everything is kind of sucked. You know? So I think that for somebody like Sean F., frankly, it was all about getting it out into the world. And I don't think he really cared that much about the control of what would happen to it. I think that he knew that if he could get a working system into people's hands, they would pick it. That was, that's part of his whole community ethos. You know, it's almost that open source ethos. Just get the damn thing out there, let the people have at it. But again, you can't be money oriented if you look at things that way, because you can't monetize that. You know, if you don't have your arms around it, if you don't create a, I mean, that's what Facebook did that was genius. And that's the lesson that Parker learned from Napster that he was so valuable in providing to Zuckerberg, which is like, look, we got to like draw everybody in. We got to lock these bastards in our space and we can't let them out. And then we can start charging them up the ass for everything, you know? And that's what, that's what Facebook model was. And that's why it was, it was worth so much. And that's why Napster, the reason Napster really made any, never made any money in my opinion is because Sean Fanning at the root of the whole thing never gave a shit about money anyway. This duality that Winner's talking about is almost always left out of the story of Napster. In fact, if you notice, uh, Fanning's not even mentioned at all in the idea of who created Napster in the film The Social Network. It's as though he's been totally written out of the story, and all that's left is the charismatic shark in a silken suit, played with KG aplomb by no less than pop icon Justin Timberlake as Sean Parker. The duality, it gets left out. What's really interesting about this is the fact that the star of the film, Jesse Eisenberg, the writer, Aaron Sorkin, and the director, David Fincher, all went on record to say that they had very little experience with and very little interest in social media. So these are people writing and creating the film about Facebook who could care less about it because they want to tell a compelling, entertaining story. And to have some of that duality there makes it clunkier and longer and more complicated than it need be. But this, this leads us to an interesting quandary about these kinds of characters, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, whomever else, who are being represented and without that complicated aspect of the dark and light and all the grays in between. Um, indeed, the entire film social network is bookended by the question, is Mark Zuckerberg an asshole? So what exactly is it that Hollywood, that the established studios are trying to say about these techie, weirdo, geeky, nerdy characters? Um, yeah, I, I actually can, can speak to that because it's, 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 it is a big issue for me as well. The reality is, is that, you know, going back to this look at the rebel outsider, you know, the, the establishment, the status quo, the, the existing paradigm system that's been in place, you know, since the, before the Victorian era in terms of the power base that, that runs business and capital is extremely threatened by the democratization of culture via technology. And I'm not speaking about Apple and Jobs, who is absolutely part of the, the establishment and the system, but people like Sean Fanning, people like Sean Parker, people like Zuck, you know, the, the you know, Anonymous, Dread Pirate Roberts, Bitcoin, uh, you know, Satoshi, the whole idea of Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, this, you know,
know, the, 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 the age of technology that we are now entering into is posing an enormous uh, threat to the est establishment. Some, to some degree, it's justified. To a large degree, it's total fucking paranoia. The Social Network is a movie about technological rebellion on its surface, but in my opinion, in actuality, is actually an argument from the establishment against the uh, rebel uprising. It is basically, it's dressed up as a biography of a rebel uprising, but it is actually the counter argument from the establishment against that rebel out uprising. That's what that movie is, whether you like it or not. The, the, the movie is made, as I said, by people who, who vocally and vigorously admitted that they don't like this new wave of technology and its possibilities. Up to this point, we're talking about Winter's personal opinion of the motivations of some of these filmmakers who he respects, but is a little suspicious about why they're trying to do what they're doing. But then we got into a very specific, very direct experience he had himself in the making of his Napster documentary detailing the tumultuous journey of Sean Fanning and Sean Parker that makes him seem little less paranoid. Uh, Downloaded was originally written as a studio movie. I originally wrote it as a narrative in 2001 for a major Hollywood studio. I could never get that damn thing off the ground. And it became very clear to me that I couldn't get it off the ground because the entrenched system wanted Fanning portrayed as a villain. And they could not wrap their heads around the idea of him being played as a character with two dimensions who mm. had a pure heart but may have been wallowing into legal gray areas. That was not only anathema to them, it was offensive to them. You know, I mean, look how far behind the MPAA still is, the RAA, like how out of touch they are with the world that we're living in today. They get it all wrong, and they don't want to get it right. They just want to burn it down. They don't like these people. They don't like people who talk about whether piracy is or isn't really what they say it is, whether copyright law should be dismantled and rebuilt. You know, it goes all the way to campaign reform and like what Lessig is doing with the Mayday Pact. You know, there are very, very, and what Aaron Swartz was trying to do, these outsiders are completely connected. And so to me, the social network was, it was the empire striking back. It was Hollywood saying, okay, we're going to make your movie, but we're going to make a movie about a bunch of fucking morally corrupt, bankrupt scumbags. And we're not going to show them as trying to build community. We're not going to show them as having any likable qualities. We're not going to show them as having a revolutionary spirit that may help the world become a better place. We're going to p portray them as insidious, repugnant, greedy villains. And, then, you know, I, I can't name names, but there was a point when I, I started to get downloaded set up after, after I got it back from the studio as an independent film. And I got it set up at a company, at an independent film company that's owned by a major tech billionaire. And... I was like, we were going to make it. They flew me to New York. I'd rewritten the script. We were going into pre-production. All I had to do was have one conversation with the tech billionaire or his people or whatever it was first. And this was after I'd done all this work. I had that conversation. And again, that, that Silicon Valley guy wanted me to paint Sean Fanning as a villain. And, then to, and this was years before the social network was made. And at that, at that moment, it became really clear to me, the establishment does not want to back stories about outsiders in this world because they're scared shitless of them but the problem with that approach is that it's not only as you say kind of repellently negative which it is but it's also destructively inaccurate because it doesn't speak it doesn't speak the truth which is that it's these outsiders that are help that have the best possibility of helping drive world culture and the establishment into a better place than where it is, than in the entrenched values that it currently has. And that's one of the, another one of the reasons I'm drawn to outsiders, you know? This led us into a quick discussion about a similar tone that Hollywood and the media paint WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange by. He has as many flaws, including unbridled arrogance, but it tends to come up as solely malevolent in a lot of the stories about him in the media or Hollywood. That's not only inaccurate, but indeed harmful to the image of similar rebel outsider thinkers and innovators, whether you like them as people or not. It's extremely narrow-minded and shallow thinking to portray 
people who are brilliant and revolutionary as, as having to be either good or bad. Because by virtue of the fact of the courage and the intelligence that it takes to be able to devise and implement these systems, whether it be what, you know, what Sean implemented with act, actually being able to turn the internet from this, you know, extremely mundane, ugly, rarefied, you know, military and university oriented technology into something that everyone in the world could, could take part in. Mm. Of course that person is going to have a lot of dimensionality. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, to me, that's human nature. Like we're human beings human beings are driven by, you know, um, our emotions and, and our, our base instincts and we're animals and, you know, an animal that's that smart and that emotionally driven, you know, like Sean was so emotionally impacted by music and its ability to change that it inspired the sort of physics and math mind that he has, which is profound to actually p to create this thing. So, you know, that person's going to throw off some sparks. They're not going to be like people always say about his son. It's like, well, he's such an asshole. It's like, what the fuck has that got to do with anything? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. It's like, yeah. who fucking cares? Yeah. And, you know, it's, of course he's an asshole. The guy <laughs> had the balls to basically dump enormous amounts of classified information out into the world. What kind of person does that? You really <laughs> think they're going to be a really mild mannered, nice guy that like never puts a, a foot the wrong way? Of course not. Think of this. We love our antiheroes and villains, be they Darth Vader, the Klingons, or gangsters in all different kinds of TV shows and films, because they rock a certain kind of swagger, be they Walter White in Breaking Bad or, say, Tony Soprano. And yet in real life, we might not necessarily afford them such leeway, because if you met a real gangster like the characters in Goodfellas, maybe, or met the guy who just sold drugs to your kid who OD'd, you don't really care about the complexities of his personality. You just hate him. So it's easier to paint these outsider rebels as plain bad or assholes in films and stories dealing with real life characters. It allows us to dig deeper into the human condition if we have the willingness to examine, as you were just saying, what some of the positives may be and what may otherwise be a negative seeming person or situation. Winner can see the duality here, even in technology itself. As pro-tech and digital realm as he may be, he can also see how the speed of all this, all the texting and ubiquitous screens and aggressive pervasiveness of online culture, etc., may need to be looked at with a more discerning eye. A couple of things, because I'm not just a tech acolyte. There's a lot of stuff about tech that I that I think is really ugly. And my general response to technology is that, for the most part, it's it's helping a lot. It's democratizing a lot. It's knocking a lot of barriers down, and it will really help usher in a new age of democratization, whether people like it or not. So I will caveat it by saying that most of this stuff, I think, is an upside. Right. I think that the downside is that you know the way capitalism works by nature. Um, it will often, uh, literally, as you were saying before, the for natural market forces will tend to allow the greediest, most nefarious people to win exactly, um, and to turn a, a really great community into a hideous, you know, over-advertised and over-exclusionary um, community that keeps the, you know, the wealthy and the privileged intact and keeps out anybody else. Uh, which is the opposite of what is good about technology. So those are the main things I don't like about it. You know, the fact that when, you know, music is a good example, the new boss will probably be worse than the old boss, or right. at least the same as the old boss. However, there will be all these rebellions that you can't really stop, and that will be a good thing. Um, as far as, like, texting and kids, you know, this is where, this is where it does get under my skin a bit, because I have three kids. It's like, you know, and also the, the, the two things I have issue with is that, and the other one being that, like, now there's no quiet time, or that, you know, in the, in the past, we just read books, you know, which is bullshit, you know. I mean, I spent my entire childhood glued to Abbott and Costello movies from the moment I got home to the moment I went to bed. I wasn't reading, you know, Jane Eyre. Fuck it, I was watching Match Game, you yeah, know, and yeah. Fantasy Island. It's like the, the world has always been filled with junk, and people have always wanted to be distracted with junk, you know, going all the way back to the dawn of man. So that, the idea that technology is sort of like hurt culture or disturbed culture in that way. Honestly, I think it's complete and utter bullshit. I think the other, I think in most ways it's actually helped it. It's gotten better books and better movies and better content and better news 
into people's hands around the world that just didn't have access to it before. And as far as kids go, my kids don't watch TV uh, during the week. They don't get on electronics. That's what we do as parents, you know? Yeah. I think there was a great article in the New York Times like yesterday, the day before yesterday, that like most people in tech don't allow their kids to gorge themselves on tech all the time. Steve Jobs didn't let his kids on an iPad, you know? It's like, it's called parenting. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's like the people who are letting their kids, you know, on their iPads all day long are the same parents who let their kids watch TV all day long when I was a kid. They're just... They're just absentee parents. For all of Winner's optimism about this technology, I still can't help but wonder about the falsity of so-called egalitarianism on the net. I mean, as much as we're told over and over again that anyone can have a voice and place online, reality is these huge corporations offering multi-multi-millions to folks creating certain pop culture websites or YouTube channels or apps or social media networks continue to swoop in buy some idealistic young person's platform and turn it into exactly what they always do, be they Condé Nast, Disney, or AOL Time Warner. So I asked Winner, what are his thoughts on how to keep these outlier technologies and concepts as pure as what he claims people like Sean Fanning meant them to be? Um, that's exactly what my new movie is about. Okay. So, you know, the documentary <laughs> that I'm making right now, uh, Deep Web, um, is about that exact question. And it, it's it's looking at Bitcoin. It's looking at the Dread Pirate Roberts. It's looking at you know the block the whole notion of the blockchain. It's looking at um, you know the journalists and dissidents who are using Tor to stay hidden. And the whole theme of this movie is what is the shape of real rebellion and freedom in technology moving forward? Who will these players be? And how will the tech actually even function? Mm -hmm. Like what will be the internet of tomorrow as controlled by this army? And it is an army of people who don't, who are libertarian by nature, not by politics. A lot of these people aren't like, you know, Rand Paul people or whatever. They just, they want, they want the technology to be democratized. They don't want the privilege to be the only ones who have access to it. They don't want it to get co-opted and branded. Um, and there's a, those people are very, very bright. They run the gamut from the, the some of the, the most famous cryptographers that built the internet in the first place, some of whom I've spoken to <laughs> right. for this movie, who are amazing people, all the way to like the Cody Wilsons and the Dread Pirate Roberts and you know the people of today who are young and uh, building new new systems and ways forward. I honestly think that that there is no way, as, as the torrent uh, revolution showed us, there's no way to put the toothpaste back in the tube. So I think that what we have is we will have a an entrenched status quo. That, I mean, the free market is not going away. You know, we're not going to have another red October. If we do, it will be disastrous. You know, the, the, the market is, go, is the market. And there's a political, I make TV commercials for a living. You know what I mean? I'm not like yeah. an anarchist. You know, I, I tell stories in the system. That's what right. I do. You know, I did that intentionally. That's what I, I've been in the system since I was a kid. So there's the system. There's the status quo, the establishment. And then there's this humongous under, under net, I call it. Um, and those people are disrupting things on a massive level. They'll come out, you know, the blockchain's potentialities for disruption are vast beyond Bitcoin. You know, the notion of a black market and like what's happening in in the wake of the Silk Road one going down is vast and unstoppable and it's here to stay and it's going to get more robust and more widespread and harder to stop and harder to track. You know, the notion of using Tor hidden services or other forms of of cryptography in order to completely evade Backdoors is absolutely here to stay and not going to be able to be cracked by anybody. And if it does, that will get cracked again. The 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 level of youth, the, the intelligence of the youth that are coming up in cryptography right now is mind blowing. And so I think that that we just have to get used to the idea of this world, you know, having that dualistic nature, which goes back to the duality of the outsider, right. where we are both in the system and outside the system. And many of us, I would say myself included, have a foot in each. The movie Alex is talking about here is Deep Web, and it did actually come out last year, narrated, funnily enough, by his Bill and Ted's cohort, Keanu Reeves. Now, his filmmaking career over the last two decades has led him into everything from commercials and animation to feature films and documentaries, as we know, as well as episodical television, like the regrettably short-lived betas on Amazon, which can clearly be seen as an early precursor to HBO's popular and award-winning Silicon Valley. I asked Winner what he feels about the comparison of the two shows and was a little surprised by his answer. 
I'm actually developing a show about Silicon Valley myself at the mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, my feelings on it are that, and I said this about the Napster story, is that there's room for a gazillion stories about Silicon Valley because it is actually the epicenter of the big paradigm shifts in global culture. So mm-hmm. I enjoy it. For me, I enjoy Silicon Valley, even though I don't see it as a show about Silicon Valley. <laughs> Valley at all. You know, I see it. Um, I betas to me was more actually about Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that betas hewed closer to the realities of Silicon Valley. I feel that the Silicon Valley show is really entertaining, but it's doing what Mike judge loves to do, which is put a bunch of really compelling, funny characters together and watch them just go at each other. It's more, it's more of a care an ensemble character study. And that's what he does. You know what I mean? He's really, really good at it. I really enjoy watching those characters fucking with each other. Whereas with betas, I, I, there were, there was the whole other component of like really feeling like I was getting a sense of what, it was like to actually try to move through this world mm. and, and deal with the moral complexity of that and the ambiguities of that. I get that less from the Silicon Valley show, personally. Winner might have a valid point. In fact, during the course of my interviews with techies from Silicon Valley, I was actually told at one point, turn off HBO and come see what it's really like here. But there's no question Betas and Silicon Valley, in fact, had at least one distinct connection that might have made things a little awkward for cast and crew alike. I was shooting my Betas episode, and the Silicon Valley pilot was shooting, and we literally were sharing the same hallway. Like, we were connected to each other. It was really weird. Now that I knew so much more about Alex's personal take on outsiders, particularly in the world of tech, it was time to turn the microscope on Alex himself as an outsider, who is constantly bouncing around from different kinds of films, iconic parts, medium formats, and countries ever since he was a young boy. And this is, goes back to the outsider thing. It's like, I've always been an outsider. You mm-hmm. know, I moved from, you know, my parents are modern dancers, which is the outsider end of the dance world. You know, uh, my mom started a dance company in London. Uh, it was pretty much the first modern dance company in Europe. And then we moved to St. Louis. When I was very young, she went to teach at Wash U. And my dad created a dance company in the Midwest. And, you know, so we were always outsiders. It's like I was going to this normal suburban school, but I had an English accent. But my parents, but there were always dancers, like, sleeping on our floor. We were this sort of bohemian artsy family. I entered show business professionally when I was nine, you know, so, you know, I started traveling around. I went on on to a national tour with the King and I, the Broadway run when I was like 12, 13, you know, so I, I never really had a distinct hometown. I've always lived in different places out of suitcase. I mean, I've had, you know, as I'm a family man, I've got like a home and my kids go to school and they feel very grounded and rooted, but I personally don't. Mm-hmm. And I never have. I just, I've always been a bit of sort of a vagabond bohemian and that's the way my family was and that's the way I am. And so, you know, the upside of that is that I don't really have an issue with any of the stuff you're talking about because I don't really connect. Like I'm not Bill, you know, I don't feel, you know, and the the valley thing you're talking about is more, is honestly, my vernacular is more to do with my St. Louis American upbringing. I never grew up on the West coast. Mm. I had no, no uh, connection to the valley of any kind. Keanu and I were, Basically, I was a New Yorker and he was from Toronto and we had to go spend time out there just to know what the <laughs> fuck it was because we had no proximity to that world at all. But of course, yeah, you know, my 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 vocabulary is peppered with dude and awesome. And, right. and I have I grew up in America at a time when that was the vernacular. And that sure. is absolutely happily part of my vernacular. I, I you know, not an effete person by nature. Right. Um, but I am nomadic by nature and I don't really feel any definitive connection i really you know in my acting and in my storytelling i tend to get driven by theme and as you said my themes tend to be pretty similar and i haven't ever really had a problem with that because i think that you know i'm drawn to people and stories that are like me enough that we all connect and that we look past the sort of outside you know i don't think that fanning i think fanning connected me as sort of with as a fellow sort of techno-oriented, community-driven outsider. We really hit it off. And I don't think he really saw me as Bill, to be honest with you. I think he knew I'd been in those movies, but we sort of looked deeper than that. And um, I'm dealing with that on the new doc with the people I'm talking to in this world. We connect on on a fundamental level sort of that goes beyond the fact that I can't write code and they don't know how to play air guitar. Well, thank you again for listening to our second episode of Nerds. I guess all I can say is go out there and be excellent to each other. And, of course, party on, dudes. 
Producer Rob Schulte here, wanting to say thank you, Alex Winter, for sitting down and chatting with Matt. This was an incredible interview, and I enjoyed editing it and putting it together. This show was produced by me, Rob Schulte. You can find more of my work at my website, robkschulte.com. R-O-B, the letter K, S-C-H-U-L-T-E. And of course, you can find out more about the host, Matthew Clickstein, at his website, M-A-T-H-E-W-K-L-I-C-K-S-T-E-I-N.com. One more thank you goes out to Mark Johnston for creating the theme music. If you get the chance, look us up on nerdspodcast.com or rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Whatever you do, make sure you subscribe and tell your friends about it. It would be totally triumphant. 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 Triumphant.